And welcome everybody. Um, after I hope it was a relaxing time, perhaps uh, for some of you, if not all of you, during the spring break. <clears throat> and uh, now we have um, the second half of the semester, we have uh, Art of India. Tonight, we're going to focus on that. It'll be our topic. <laughs> and of course, we've already passed the midway point. And so I have some annou announcements to make before we get to tonight's lecture. But I can tell you that based on the number of slides and having done this lecture, of course, uh, several times before, we, we will probably end more than 10 minutes early, maybe maybe even 15. Um, hang on, just a couple more people wanted to come in. Oh, <clears throat> um, all right. So I've got several announcements and I'm thinking we're gonna keep getting people joining in the next few minutes. So I'm saving the most important ones for that right before we start the slide lecture portion. But we'll we'll probably take a well will we will take an early break earlier than usual and we'll end uh, anywhere from oh 15 to 20 minutes earlier depending on how many questions people have of course. Uh, but but we do need a break in the middle uh, roughly halfway through. Okay, um, I might as well go ahead and dive into the first topic of uh, I call it house cleaning, which means that I want to cl clear up some. Um, possible uncertainty for some students, only a, a small percentage, but th there were students who said they sent me their email of uh, the PDF, I mean, uh, file of their uh, midterm. And in a handful of cases, I didn't get them. That's only like one or two in each class, this class and the other one I'm teaching this semester. But there were a number of people who, when I went to return their tests with the you know, grade and everything, uh, it bounced right back to me. And, and I finally figured out why that was happening is because some people are sending me their tests through a different email that isn't the one registered with the college, which I have a record of. And it's the only one I have, you know, any kind of stored record of. Uh, so if that's the case, in other words, if you turned in your test on time and you didn't yet get your grade back, you know, uh, and you know, a summary of how you did from from me via the reader or me. I graded the ones you know that I graded will directly say the return emails from me. But either way, actually, it will. They all say that because I'm forwarding them to you from the readers or my own grading. Uh, and I check. I just want you to make sure. I mean, to make sure you all know that I am not. Uh, doing, you know, just a, a blindly entering grades from a reader before I look through their comments. I would always check first and occasionally I'll see something where they maybe were a little too strict, which doesn't happen that often, but occasionally it does, or even made an addition error. And my philosophy about those corrections is this, if the error was in your favor, I don't change it. You get the benefit of them having not, you know, maybe deducted quite as many points as I would have. Reverse being the case if they took off too many points or they made an addition error that wasn't in your favor and therefore those points I will add. I have already done that. So I've written, in other words, I've returned all the midterms that I got in on time that I could and only a handful I did, were, was not or were not able to return uh, because of the uh, anomaly of, you know, like some of the email addresses, that tagline isn't even anything to do with the name of the student and then the email return address, I don't know, it must be some other friend, family member that, that some students have used. That causes confusion. And so if that's happened, it's, it should be easy to fix for you to get your uh, grade uh, as soon as you email me within 24 hours usually. Again, and state that with an email, this is the key. An email address is the same, needs to be the same one you used when you registered that the college has on file. That's how you should be able to get your test scores back directly. Um, and then I usually write a little line at the top about how you did if, you know, there's any kind of questions, of course, you can always email me. Anyway, so if anybody didn't get their test back and knows for sure they submitted it, either it didn't go through, then email me. And if that's the case, if I never got it at all, I, I certainly can count it and not take points off. If you have, uh, you know, the original email 
uh, and it was just somehow sent to the wrong address or got blocked for some reason. And, you know, high tech isn't perfect. I think we know that, right? I certainly learned that. So things do sometimes fall through the cracks, but we have plenty of time to correct that. I don't want anyone to get stressed out and think they're not going to get credit for work they already did. Which leads to the other announcement, which I sent you everyone an email on both in both classes, which is a few students just never submitted uh, who are not at this point showing up as dropping the class, so they're still registered, uh, have not, uh, a few in each class, ha have not sent me uh, the midterm. Some of these are people who did send me a paper and even got a good grade on it. So I'm not sure what the reason is, but there's only one uh, way that students who didn't already submit a midterm by the deadline can be allowed to do a makeup. This is not my rule. This is the district, the Santa Rosa JC and the art department that I teach at, of course, their rule, uh, which is that if you have written evidence of an emergency from either a health emergency or a family emergency, such as, you know, a doctor's visit, a prescription, right, uh, or, or a plane ticket for something you had, you know, family, urgent family business. In other words, if you were physically unable to be present during that entire week of the exam, which was March 9th through 14th, then you can show me, you need to send me a screenshot or whatever of evidence that are in writing. And if that happens, then I confirm that and you can then, I will arrange for an alternative makeup. But there aren't very many people that I think that usually doesn't apply to more than a handful each semester. But if that does apply to anybody uh, in this class or listening tonight, um, there we go. That's your option uh, to try and um, see if there is a, a route to, to do makeup. And then the other uh, route for making up uh, missing points, even if let's say you did the exam and most people did well, but not everyone gets an A or a B on any exam in any class, right? So if you didn't get the grade you wanted and you're missing some points from what you were hoping for on either the midterm or the first paper, you can do extra credit and get up to 50 points. I've now put together uh, a more detailed list of what that means. There are five options. I'm not gonna repeat them now but I will resend that as an email to everyone probably tomorrow, certainly before the weekend. But you can always email me individually, again, at any time during the semester, right up through even uh, before the final, the day of the final. Uh, but don't wait till a few hours before the test. And I can tell you your point total, what you've learned up to that point and what grade that would give you. And uh, then you can figure out how many more points you need to get the grade you want at the end of this semester. Or you can email me for that anytime. Obviously I wouldn't give that out over the uh, Zoom meeting. That's not appropriate to tell other people what grades different students got. Okay, so those are the first two and most important announcements relating to the midterm and uh, grades. I hear some but he's got their camera. I mean, their camera. Their Can you turn that off, please, so we can all hear you? <laughs> Hang on. I didn't. Hope that person hears and can, yeah, thank you. Mute that. All right. I do have another minor, well, it's not so minor, about the vaccinations. I'm not going to ask people to, well, if you want to, because in my class last night, a whole bunch of people volunteered after I stated this, but there's a, a new twist on what I said last night that just came up today. If you haven't gotten your vaccination, obviously it's probably because you're not in a group that's been authorized, but even my 18 year old, you just turned 18 year old daughter will be eligible as would all of you uh, after April 15th, according to the state regulations and each county. Of course, that has to do with availability, but I, I wouldn't wait. You, you do have to be diligent and you have to be persistent, as you probably know, to get um, an appointment. But there should be, there is steadily increasing supply of the vaccine uh, vaccines. I mean, and uh, all three of them, the American made ones are, you know, almost, uh, there's a slight difference, but almost equally effective, highly. It's worth the minor inconvenience or hassle of getting the appointment. And yes, there'll be some small side effects. And my students last night stated that they thought uh, the one with the least effects, uh, you know, it, was a, it was sort of a small informal group, right? A consensus of maybe eight students. Uh, but in my experience with m some of my readers and other, um, you know, former students and friends uh, from, you know, 
my generation or younger, obviously, especially uh, millennials, uh, it seems to be that the Pfizer has slightly less frequent see of uh, side effects. None of the side effects are serious and they're all temporary, but it's whatever you can get. And Johnson and Johnson is of course everyone knows it's a single shot. So there's that advantage. So if you plan ahead, just give yourself, a, a, the point is maybe two days if you can do it that way, like over a weekend or when you're not gonna be working or taking a class where you have work to do, if it's just listening to a lecture like this, that shouldn't be a problem because the worst side effects are headaches, you know, that go, they're not severe, but they go away in a few hours or a day or so. Fatigue and, uh, you know, maybe some minor joint pain. Again, all of which uh, everyone I've talked to have had those, they have passed quickly. So hopefully that is gonna be an incentive because we're, rumors are circulating that we're gonna go back to in-person teaching in the fall. I know we're not this summer, I wish we were. So hopefully that will be the case. Uh, but it won't be if not enough people get vaccinated. So I'm going to go ahead and do the full screen view here. And then the only other thing on that note, and then we'll uh, I'll take any questions you have before we start the lecture and you know the first slide notes. Um, and that's this. Um, I saw an article in the Chronicle. Yes, I'm one of those people who still reads print newspapers. Yeah, um, the San Francisco Chronicle. I used to write for them regularly you know, freelance, but they used to actually pay for these now. They don't have a budget for that. So I don't do that uh, anymore, but I do read it. And there was a piece there that just uh, brightened up my day. It was about something my daughter and I have been talking about for months as we take our, I call them daddy daughter drives on Saturday. It's the day we you know, go out and have lunch and talk about what's happened the last week etc and what's on her mind so it's just one of those things where we happen to be thinking whenever the point comes in who knows you know each person has a different perception uh that we feel at least in the bay area let's say a majority of people living in the bay area that the worst of the pandemic is over we were talking about how we should try to through our friends or some social media channel organize a group sing-along of the beatles here comes the sun and guess what that's what they're doing at the largest mass vaccination clinic in San Francisco, Moscone Center. The staff there decided that would be an appropriate way to lift the spirits of people waiting to get their vaccination and how they, and it just is a nicely written piece. So what does that have to do with anything besides the coincidence? I forwarded a proposal to On the Road, some of you know, maybe a few of you, Steve Hartman, one of my favorite journalists, he always says something positive. And in this day and age, the way the news is, it's been for a long time, but even especially the last year, it's so nice to see his, his stories are always on CBS News, but they're also online, of course. And he always picks some uplifting topics. So I sent a proposal to him to send a camera crew and himself, of course, down to San Francisco, because he does stories from all over the country, and capture the wonderful reactions that this staff has seen people react when they hear that song or after their shot is over and they're leaving or waiting in line to get there. It brings tears to people's eyes. If you don't know that song, you should listen to it, at least after you get your shot anyway. It, the lyrics are perfectly suited for, for, for this point in our country's history. So I sent that proposal to both the local CBS affiliate, because they're right here, they might find it more practical. Probably nothing will come of it, but if I hear from them, I'll let you know. And that would be worth extra credit for you to, uh, I don't know what, you know, send a link or something if you saw it online <clears throat> or even maybe watched it live on local news. Channel 5 has, of course, several broadcasts. It's a CBS affiliate uh, and or um, unlikely that the national CBS news picks it up. Anyway, it's just I thought it was timely because I think most of us are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I hope all of you are but that depends on each of us getting our shots and of course, staying safe in the meantime. Okay, any comments, questions about the first part of what we were talking about before we start the slides? In other words, about the midterms or uh, you know, email snafus or, or extra credit or your grades in general, any questions at all before we start the lecture? And of course, at the end of this lecture, I'll stick around, I always do, as long as it takes for any questions that people have after we finish the last slide. That's it for now. Okay, then let's get started with um, the first slide. We're going to talk about India. Well, let, let me give you the context first. I always like to start with that. Um, 
I have a slide in the slide file that I spent some time uh, creating with the help of, oh, someone else wants to join here, okay. With the help of a very uh, tech savvy assistant that's been always there for all of us teachers in the evening classes at uh, Annalee Hall in art history. He's always come up within like three minutes after we call him and, and figured out when there was a snafu. That was when we did in-person teaching, of course. Anyway, he helped me put this file together, but the one thing that didn't get into the file, I guess we both just didn't notice it was a map. So I'm gonna do it this way. I've got the Stockstead. You don't have to make any notes. Now, remember, this is just a little um, intro information. I'll just hold it up a little bit for you to see. This map shows cities of India that were there, some of which are now and currently, of course, but they're mostly the cities that were there 500 to 2,500 years ago during the period we're covering uh, with these slides. For instance, in the north, near the border of Nepal, in fact, it's just below that very northern edge of India is Patna, which is the area where Buddha spent a lot of his time in his early years, um, you know, wouldn't say lecturing really, you know, um, but, you know, uh, enlightening, that's a word he would have used. We're going to talk about Buddha, Buddhism, and all of that, of course, with several slides of him. Uh, images of him tonight. So that's in Northern uh, was a town. I don't know if it's not still called that. And then some of these other towns along the coast turns out were Roman trading posts. The Romans traded with India more than I realized. I've been reading up on that. I got uh, history of India for Christmas as one of my presents. And then uh, also there is uh, Sanchi, which is gonna be, I think one of the most interesting because we have three de uh, views, including details of a stupa. What, and you'll know what that is by the end of this evening. Uh, and that's a slide that is very important. And I'll tell you when we get to it uh, is, is so important. I'm not cutting it from the study list. And Sanchi is a town in dead almost center of India. Uh, and uh, some of the other places, of course, I won't enumerate those. Uh, that you'll see mentioned. So if you have your Stockstead text or any edition or version of it, you might want to you know, glance at that. You don't have to know the locations uh, of, of each of those things unless the, that's in the syllabus. Of course, then you would want to remember those for the exam or look them up <laughs> from the syllabus. As you know, it's an open book final, the finals, exact same length and format and number of slides. And we'll review for it as the midterm was. Okay, so let's get started with our first must-know slide for tonight. Okay. Uh, and let's hide this here so we can see. All right. Can okay, everybody see this? Hopefully. <laughs> yes. Good, thank you, thank you. I just need one confirmation. All right. This is the first must know, and uh, it's the oldest slide we're going to see tonight. Bust, you know, B-U-S-T, right? Bust of a man from Indus, that's I-N-D-U-S, Indus Valley. I'll say it again. The title is Bust of a Man from Indus Valley. That's one of the major rivers in India. And the location is actually not India anymore. It used to be for hundreds if not thousands of years but now it's a separate country so the location is Pakistan and you probably know that that's spelled P-A-K-I-S-T-A-N and the date we have it rounded off oh that is one thing I noticed a few people assumed that when I said you could round the date to a zero you could just give me the century uh, that wasn't what I was saying on dates I think it's reasonably flexible but in case this is the rule that I stated clearly and that I did have to you know, follow up on in case someone didn't do it, which would be if you rounded to a century, that's too far off. Uh, it needs to be the right decade. But of course, a bunch of dates like this one tonight, several of them are so far back, we don't even have the decade. So this one's already rounded off. Obviously, it's, we just know approximately 2000 years BC or BCE. So that makes it over 4000 years old. Okay, so what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at a um, slightly smaller, I think is the phrase, slightly smaller than life-size uh, image of the upper body. See, when it says bust, usually people think only the head, neck, and shoulders. But this, you can tell if you look here, 
is, is you know, obviously been damaged over the centuries, but it originally was an image all the way down to the waist of the, so the whole upper body, you know, it's originally, it was, um, you know, you could even say, and you know, it's more than the bust of, but now we just call it that because that's all, all that's left. Uh, part of one arm, the upper chest, the neck and the head, of course. So what, what is the reason we're looking at this? Because of there's th three main things that make this a really unusual um, artifact. First of all, uh, it's from the oldest urban civilization in the Indian subcontinent. Indian subcontinent in essence means all the areas today, which are the nations of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and uh, Kathmandu. Well, yeah, the, the whole area is from the Himalayas south to the Indian Ocean between Pakistan and Bangladesh. And you may or may not know this, Bangladesh just turned 50. I uh, remember George Harrison, yes, one of the Beatles releasing an album that sold like 10 million copies before Michael Jackson was even coming close to that uh, to raise money for Bangladesh because of the um, the attack on that that part of Pakistan they broke away for independence they didn't want to be part they speak a different language they, you know they didn't want to be in there all the way across India so if that's why I held that map up and I should have mentioned that back then so all you can say is now those are separate countries but back then it was all what we just call ancient India the ancient subcontinent is the right way to say it Vindy, because it's it's a huge area by the way I also as you have to write this now we'll get back to the next fact on the meaning of this in a minute but this uh, uh, subcontinent India as a country, I'm sorry, let me rephrase, India, the country of India today, the modern nation, has the second largest population on earth and it will soon become the largest population. It will surpass China within the next few years. There's very little doubt of that. Uh, it has almost 1.4 billion and China slightly over that. Uh, the population is now growing more rapidly in India than almost any other part of uh, Asia. And it is one quarter no, sorry, one third the land area of the United States. So what does that mean? It's simple math, simple arithmetic. That country is 12 times more crowded than we are with only a third the land and four times the population. Now, that's why there's you know obviously not a lot of open space except for jungle areas of India. It's a very crowded country. Okay, back to the notes now for this. What are the facts about it that you need to know? First of all, it's, one of the oldest relics I was just saying, uh, from the earliest urban civilization on the Indian subcontinent, which was called the Indus Valley Civilization. That should be easy to you know, remember because it's part of the title, right? The Indus, and that's the river, one of the main rivers in Indi India. Indus Valley Civilization was the root, some would say, of all European and Western languages and some would even say culture, though that's a little harder to, to make the case. But definitely the root languages for all of the European languages, and if you look those up, almost every language in Europe, with the exception of Finnish, for some reason the Finns are not part of this, <laughs> and uh, Hungarian, those two countries. Otherwise, every other part of Europe, Western, Eastern, Southern, Northern Europe, has an Indo-European based language from which the root was this culture. That's pretty impressive when you think about it. So obviously it, it uh, was the uh, origin point for much of what later became the migrations that went into uh, areas of Europe that later formed into the various language groups, you know, all over Europe. Um, so that's one reason the Indus Valley civilization is as India in general, we could just say is one of the five oldest urban civilizations on earth. The others, uh, I think I've mentioned them are uh, China, Babylon, Egypt, and Mesoamerica, which we will cover, right, uh, Central America. Okay, so that's one fact, is Indus Valley Civilization is the oldest one in that subcontinent. Another is that uh, this would be a high priest. We're almost certain that, that this was an image of probably a portrait of an individual, but if not, then a general or generic, you could use the word, general image of a high priest. Why do we think that? Well, that's part of the meaning. The clues are, are all over his, the image of his face. Let's start with the beard. The longer the beard or, or you know, fuller, you can say, or longer, 
the beard more prominent. You could write it that way, uh, the beard on any image of any uh, important person in ancient times. This applies all over the ancient world from Asia, Japan, China, but particularly India, all the way across the Mediterranean through ancient Greece and early Rome. Later on, the Romans got rid of beards. Some of the, the emperors didn't have beards, but the early ones did. So what we're saying is the more prominent the beard on a portrait of anyone, the more important they are. A high priest can't be more important. That is one of the highest ranking roles in any culture. And so this particular um, civilization had a priest class and we're almost certain he was a member. The other two clues are his eyes nearly being closed. So you could say a nearly closed ex uh, eyed expression or his eyes are uh, almost shut. And that's implying that he's meditating or having some kind of prayer, right? Uh, contemplation. So a, a phrase I like to use is, is contemplative state of mind. That would obviously go with a priest, uh, especially a high priest, that they would be meditating or thinking about the important uh, questions that they have to deal with as a high priest. And then the last detail that really does almost totally confirm that this was a high priest, this image, is uh, what some people think that have had students say, it looks like a belt buckle, but it's, uh, it's a, a band across his uh, symbolic of his high status across his forehead. Probably this part was some kind of precious metal, gold maybe, or silver. Uh, and so a, um, a symbolic uh, band of high rank, you could say, or, or indication of high ranking position across his forehead is the third uh, uh, detail. But then the, the last thing about the meaning now is what he's wearing. His robes have three leaf clover patterns on them. And that would be an extremely unlikely type of detail for just an average working person or a shopkeeper, right? Or, or even a, you know, a teacher, <laughs> someone not as high ranking as a high priest. Uh, that, that would probably indicate, again, the role of this man was in some way at the highest level of the ancient religion. This is before Buddhism and Hinduism. So we're going to get to those religions in a few minutes. Hinduism was starting to, there were hints and roots, uh, beginnings of it, but it wasn't a formed religion yet. So this even predates uh, Hinduism, which is, as you probably know, the main religion of India. We'll talk about that and give it a definition of Hinduism in a subsequent slide. Okay, formal analysis. Balanced, well, yeah, I mean, of course, now it's, it's been badly damaged, but originally it was, you know, uh, the, and now some students have asked, you know, what happened with his, was there ever another arm here? You know, I can't honestly answer that. It might be that he was just, uh, had, had just one arm. That could have been the case, but we don't have any way of knowing. Nothing was found beside this or written records of any kind to indicate exactly who he was. By the way, we, we can say that it's a human body and it's intact, so it is roughly balanced. You could say it's unbalanced or weighted toward the bottom because the head is narrower than the, uh, the torso, of course. Uh, there's carved line everywhere of, on the face, especially around the beard, the eyes, and on the robe too. And that creates simulated texture, but there's also the smooth texture of the stone from which it was carved. It's actually a warm color, kind of a tannish color. It's actually redder than this photo makes it look. Uh, I've actually seen photos of it from the museum that actually that owns it. Uh, so, but here you can just say it has a color, a tan like tan ish a hue. And that of course is a, an earth tone, a warm color. Then there's the rhythm, of course, of the two eyes. Uh, obviously, the beard has these, these lines and striations, I call it. You can just say lines, which create rhythm there. And then obviously, the three leaf clover pattern repeats on the uh, robes. So there's quite a bit of uh, rhythm. It is mostly stable. I mean, the top of his head is curved but and his chin. But he's standing and fa looking towards out towards the viewer uh, in a very stable pose and his body is upright. So it's more stable than dynamic. It's a single mass. I don't think you can say there's really, you know, larger or smaller masses. It's just one mass. For space- 
uh, line is at the base? Is that what they added so it could stand up was originally? Yes, good, good point. I was right. thinking of mentioning it, but I thought, well, there's enough other stuff for you guys to write. You're right. Yes, that's according to what I've read about it. Yeah. Then I have a little fun extra credit option for you. And now that you can go to restaurants in Alameda County, I'll tell you at the end of the notes, we're almost done with the form analysis because this image is on a restaurant menu, one of my favorite restaurants. And I think if you go there, you'll see why. But let me get to that in a minute. Okay, so yes, you, you were right about that. that. That was added. That's filler, yeah, probably, you know, cement or something. Anyway, back to finishing up here, we have, um, let's see for space, just overlapping. The beard overlaps is, you know, and the, uh, you know, band, ceremonial band, uh, of course, his head and the robe overlaps his torso. Uh, and then let's see, uh, modeling is just the shadows from the museum lighting, really. Um, uh, let's see, balance, rhythm, I think we covered it. Okay, there's a restaurant in Berkeley, I'll keep this brief because I want to get to the next slide, called Cabana, K-A-B-A-N-A, -A -A. wonderfully run, well uh, deserved, it gets very many high ratings from people that have been going there like I have for years since my daughter was three, they've known her that long. It's in Berkeley on University Avenue below San Pablo, but he, there's no other restaurant in Berkeley named that. And it, they, they mostly, it's Indian food, but they're Pakistani. Uh, and there is that interesting connection. This is the image they chose for the cover, or at least it was when they had a physical menu. I don't know if it is anymore on their website, but I think so, I think it is. And their food is excellent. And if you go there, and you wouldn't order food any other way, guess, but not where you guys live. But if you're in Berkeley and you have a reason to go there, uh, make make your presence known and uh, get, get just ask for a little hand printed note or some evidence that you actually went there. You know, even a receipt that'll do, and I'll give you five points extra credit. I do not get a kickback. Okay, I want you to know that it's just they're so nice. It's a family run place and all the people that work there are like a family to each other and they treat their customers like family. And their customers are from every background you can imagine being in Berkeley. Of course, a high percentage of them are South Asian, but not all of them. The food is excellent. Anyway, Cabana, K-A-B-A-N-A. -A -A. And this image is at least what they used to use for their menu. Okay, let's move on to our next must know. And I'm skipping ahead because we, we, we can't cover more than about 10 slides or even in this case, I think it's eight tonight. But this one we're gonna spend some time on. So here we go. This slide is really important. It will not be cut from the study list and it has a very high poss I would even say probability of being on the final. So take extra careful notes and make sure you study them uh, when you review for the final. Um, okay, this, this is the second must know on the syllabus for tonight, great stupa at Sanxi. And that second word stupa, great stupa is S-T-U-P-A at Sanxi. That's the city, ancient city. I don't think it's still there anymore in India, central India, where it was built, S-A-N-C-H-I. So again, the title, great four words, great stupa at Sanxi. Location in this case, and all the rest of the slides tonight are all India. 250, 250 BC or BCE. Well, right there, that should give you some clue because we've already covered what was going on in, you know, the Mediterranean world at that time, you know, North Africa, the Middle East, Europe, you know, the Balkans, Italy, you know, Rome, Greece. This is before Rome was even an empire, when Rome was just beginning to expand outside the borders of Italy. Rome was still just another kingdom fighting for, you know, dominance. Uh, so this particular period of Indian history is a golden age. Some people call it the early or first golden age, but there's no formal phrase for it that I've read. So you could just say it was the earliest uh, golden age of their high quality art and uh, learning in a Hindu or Buddhist culture. Now, how did that happen? India today is a part of the meaning, as I said earlier, but if you didn't write it and you don't know this, you should now write this, uh, is almost entirely, well, it's like 90% Hindu and about 10% Muslim. And may, well, maybe about one or 2% Christian uh, from, you know, sister, mother Teresa, sorry. That's, a, you know, a few million Christians, but out of the population, it's overwhelmingly Hindu. Uh, but it wasn't that way back then. It was mostly Buddhist. 
So we're going to talk about that over the next few slides. But let's first just define what we're looking at. What is a stupa? Here we go, your first definition for tonight. All right. Um, it's on your list of terms as always. You should always, of course, uh, have that next to your laptop when we're doing our Zoom lectures. Stupa, I already spelled for you, right? Here we go. I'm afraid it's not a short definition. Is a Hindu or Buddhist, it could be either, a Hindu or Buddhist house of worship with a large central dome. You see that here, right? Comma. So it's a Hindu or Buddhist house of worship with a large central dome, comma, beneath which worshipers walk in a clockwise direction. Again, second part, beneath which worshipers walk in a clockwise direction, comma, and then around a collection of religious relics, period, around a collection of religious relics. Well, most churches, synagogues, mosques, right? Now, you know, a word for Hindu or Buddhist, you know, temples, one type of temple, stupa, any of those kinds of house of worship, they almost all have some kind of religious relics. Almost all of them do. So what did the stupas, the early stupas have? Well, they had relics. This is a, a, a one that was originally built uh, early on in Buddhist times. So it was a Buddhist temple, a Buddhist stupa. And we'll say what the definition of Buddhism is when we get to a slide of him. I think it's the next slide coming up. But for now, let's just talk about what a stupa is and how this functioned. This had relics from the life of Buddha inside. Again, were they real like footprints frozen in stone? You decide. <laughs> just like uh, if you put all the body parts of Jesus together, or any other of the holy figures from the Bible in all the cathedrals and, and churches throughout Europe, you'd have several bodies of each. But, you know, obviously somebody was believing in something and that's, you know, their sacred belief. So what we're saying is that they were, you could say, purported or, you know, assumed, you could even say relics, left over from the life of Buddha. They didn't get his sandals. I've never read that. That would be going too personal. But supposedly images of his footprints from places where he had walked. He walked all over for 45 years, all over northern India. Um, or things about his life. And that's what's on the gate. That's the most important detail. We're going to look up at close uh, in detail there. But first, here's your central dome, right? These are the parts of the building. It's part of the meaning you should be writing this. The central dome is the main feature of any stupa, whether it's a Buddhist or like this one or a Hindu one. And then the railings are meant, both the outer railing and the inner railing, to separate the holy, right? Well, the word they would use is sacred. So you should write that way. Sacred territory of this stupa from the mundane or uh, everyday world around it. That's a really important concept to both Buddhists and Hindus. The idea that their are houses of worship, whether they're this style stupas, which are from the earlier period or other styles later on, you'll see a few like that, that aren't this shape. Any of the Buddhist or uh, Hindu houses of worship, uh, the majority, the vast majority um, had railings incorporated into the design, an outer set of railings and an inner set, you know, near the base of the dome. And it was, again, the reason I'll repeat, is meant to symbolize the separation of the sacred world, you know, which is what you're aiming for when you practice those religions to become enlightened. They didn't use the word saved, you know, right? Or to have everlasting life, that's a Christian concept. They would say enlightened. So in order to achieve enlightenment, you're entering these, these houses of worship. And when you pass the gates, you're entering sacred area. You're leaving behind the everyday world, the mundane world is a phrase that Buddhists usually use the English phrase for it. So that's what these railings are for. But then the lintels are even more important because, or actually gates, you should say gates, because the lintel is just this section that remember from back when we had uh, the Stonehenge slides and that was uh, of course on the midterm, these cross you know, horizontal pieces of stone are called lentils, but, but just keep it simple, say the gate or gateways, all of these stupas had these, are very ornately decorated 
with sacred images and there are several types and we're going to see one of them up close in a minute but first just what types just two or three one would be scenes from the life of buddha which is what these are here he would visit you know others um you know scholars or converts you know priests who would become converted to buddhism sometimes before they met him sometimes after meeting him because he convinced them he spent that's why he spent 45 years walking around india uh and uh giving his uh you can call them lectures if you want uh and and converting literally millions of people to his system he called it of enlightenment so these are scenes from the uh life of buddha mostly from the period after he became the buddha and we'll describe what that means in a few minutes with the next slide so just say there's scenes from his life after he had uh, founded buddhism is it a religion see that sounds like a formal group like the catholic church it's not like that it's not that formal so just say after he had you know become enlightened there we go that's the phrase that we said and therefore come up with the concepts of buddhism which we will define in just a few minutes so once he had created this concept called buddhism which he then was the main proponent of uh he was quote enlightened and these are scenes from his life after that happened so it helps you if you're visiting to become enlightened supposedly if you know what you're looking at uh the other type of sacred there's two other types of sacred images are sacred animals like winged lions elephants right here's a winged lion right elephants you see of course elephants um and um let's see the other there are cows actually cows are in here somewhere if we can get mostly up around here yeah there's one uh so cows there are other sacred images but those are the three main sacred animals you see on the gates of a stupa uh, in india uh again i'll repeat that the three main type of sacred animals you see here for instance are elephants winged or winged lions and, and cows and then finally you see images of sacred images of females and let's go to one now uh which are symbolic of human for oh i forgot this i had this detail yeah that's right we have three details so here are some scenes from from the, uh, the life of buddha he would visit really rich and powerful princes and kings in different uh, india wasn't a country then right let alone an empire it was just a bunch of you know similarly uh, you know situated kingdoms small kingdoms and each one had their own government right so he'd go and visit the the rulers in each of these kingdoms and convert them to buddhism uh you know just by talking about his beliefs and they were inspired most of them not all but almost all of them did convert and then of course once they did most of their uh, citizens would so there's some more scenes from the life of buddha but let's get to the last detail here this is one of those sacred images of a uh, a sacred literally female figure who is symbolic of the fertility of the indian countryside and of the human population so she's meant to symbolize a dual you could say a dual aspect of fertility you see what she has above her head all the tropical plants and fruits right that you could find well, not all but many you see many of them that you could find in india that would be the fertility of the land of course which humans depend on to survive and then her her you know obviously very clearly indicated physiological features the details on her on her physique are emphasizing uh you know human fertility so this would be a kind of like almost like a minor goddess but a sacred uh, female figure is a good enough way to phrase that uh and this was the other kind let's back up and you'll see what i mean one of the other the three main types of sacred figures you can see there she is right there and then on there's there's another gate see there and then another one on the other side so i think it's four gates so there are sacred images of all those three types i just described on each of the gates okay uh that's pretty much the whole meaning on this uh except to say that I think this is not a minor. So it's one more thing you should write on the meaning. Look at the uh, dome, and you see that's packed or rammed earth, mud, basically dried mud, but thicker than you know. I mean, heavier than just mud, uh, which is over bricks, right? Uh, and so the dome, it's a remarkable fact that it survived twenty-five, no, two thousand two hundred, say twenty-two plus centuries, right? 250 BC. Okay, so over 22 centuries. Just keep it simple. 
well over 2000 years. And to have the dome, the original dome, it's had to be repaired, certainly, but there's been no war or other cataclysmic event that has you know, destroyed us. And luckily, I guess, no earthquakes in this part, of India, at least not big enough to destroy the dome. So it's a remarkable survivor. It's one of the oldest domes in the in South Asia period, not just India. You could say the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and one of the oldest stupas still standing. And it's remarkable it survived because it was built with, you know, the earth, the materials from the earth right there at the site. Uh, and without probably cranes or any other kind of fancy equipment like the Romans had, of course, and the Egyptians had. Um, so it was all built by hand from local natural materials and it survived well over 22 centuries. Okay, it's plenty on the meaning. Formal analysis, well, if it's on the test, you'll have the full view here. Uh, of course, you have to put your you know, imagination in, like you're standing here looking in through the right main entrance or one of the gateways. And so it were to be totally symmetrical, of course, completely balanced left to right, and uh, obviously wider at the bottom, so unbalanced toward the bottom. And then we have the rhythm of the railings, right? Which by the way, this is the third railing up here, but it's symbolic of uh, enlightenment or trying to, let's go up and you'll see that. See, these are three umbrellas and there's a, you can't see a point at the top of this. Uh, it's like a small spire, right? And it's just symbolic of the um, goal of trying to achieve enlightenment while you're on this earth or in this life. We will talk about what that is in the next slide. What does that mean? What, what is the definition of Buddhism itself? But let's do the rest of the formal analysis and <clears throat> wrap this one up. This is earth tones. I don't know if it looks cool here because on my computer screen, depending on which way I move from one side to the other, it can look almost bluish gray, but it isn't. It's a, an earth tone. There's no question it is a deep, rich kind of a dark tan color. So that's earth tones. This is closer to what the colors of the dome really look like. And the mud, of course, is brown. I mean, the, the packed earth is what they officially call that. So the earth, you just keep it simple, on the dome. Of course, that's an earth dome and therefore warm. Um, so the really, the only cool colors you could say might be on this, but look, when you get up close, you see, no, it's got a kind of a light tan color. In fact, the proof of that is the close-ups of it, you see? So, so all the, the, uh, the, the sections of this structure, gates and everything, railings, all of them are warm tones. The rhythm is obvious with the repeated shapes of the lintels, the sacred animals and, and human figures on, on the gateways uh, and the railings, okay? It is stable on the gates and at least you could say the upright sections of the railings, but the curved shape of the railings and of course the dome obviously are dynamic. And it's probably obvious, but if it isn't, you definitely want to write the largest mass is the dome. And then it would be the outer railing and then the gates, because each of the gates are about the same height and same width. They're about 15 feet high, by the way. So for space, let's do space now. The gates is a series of gates, roughly 15 feet high, which lead into a domed, one large domed room about 60 feet high with a ceiling of roughly 60 feet. Okay, and then we have, um, let's see, a line here is carved on the gateways for all the figures of humans and animals. And there is some visual line around the railings mostly, right? Um, <clears throat> and the texture is both simulated on again, the figures of animals and people on the gates, but everything else is the real rough texture of the stone. Because even here, it may look smooth. It's been worn down by centuries, of, but the, the stone there is not like marble. It's, it's, it's rough. So the rough brick, actually, it's brick on the dome, right? And stone on the railings and the actual stone work of the gates is all real rough texture of stone, but similar texture on the uh, images of animals and people, of course. Let's see, am I forgetting a thing? Uh, the largest mass balance. Uh, oh, there's no technique for modeling it. It's just the shadows from the sun. Okay, let's move on. We're gonna look at an image of Buddha and here it is. It's one of my favorite images of someone who now, uh, if any of you have more knowledge of Buddhism than perhaps, you know, um, we're covering here now, 
feel free to add a comment or two or you know whatever bring up something if you want to supplement or compliment what I'm going to tell you. Uh, when I first started teaching this world art class 1.1 when it was first created, it was like 10 years ago, something like that. Um, I knew something about Buddhism, but what I knew was the Americanized version of it. And that isn't really what you should know for this class anyway. And if you're seriously interested, many of my former students have become Buddhists. And I totally understand and of course respect that. Um, <clears throat> I can see why. So here we go. This, the next must know, uh, is the third one down. And it's oh, actually fourth one down. Standing Buddha from Sarnath. Standing, of course, is as it's always spelled Buddha. You should already know, but here it's the spelling B U D D H A, Buddha from Sarnath is S A R N A T H, India, of course, 474 AD. Or C E, if you prefer, this is an image, a life size image of what. Buddha probably did look like as a young man, not of course toward the, he lived to be over 80 years old. Oh, that was really a long life. You know, back then, most people didn't live past 50 or 60, and upper classes did, but uh, he lived a rough life. You know, he, he had to beg for his food and walked everywhere, took a lot of energy, would, you know, would, would you have to say work maybe, but, you know, have 12 hour days, you know, trying to enlighten people everywhere he went and, and, and talk with people, uh, you know, about his beliefs. And so he very rarely rested more than a few hours at night. So as a young man, we believe this is close to how he actually looked. Now, how can we know? Because there was a portrait of him created during his lifetime, which is gone now, or we'd have that image for you to look at. And his image, you know, it's someone, an artist somewhere in a village that he had visited, drew a portrait of him uh, while he was quite, you know, still healthy and, and, and active. Uh, I don't know what age, but young enough that th we have some idea that this is what he looked like. And the other is because after he died, his image, which people had fresh in their minds, if they had known him, was recreated on coins and other artifacts. So we're pretty sure he had a similar, if not exact, appearance as this statue. But, but the period is part of the meaning. 474, well, Buddha was almost a thousand years, lived almost a thousand years before this, lived and died, around 500 BC or BCE. So this is a, nearly a thousand years later. So when this was created, India, this is a really important fact, was mostly a Buddhist culture. That isn't true. I just said that a couple of times now. It's so it's ironic. It's like in its birthplace, India, Buddhism is very, very minor religion. All the rest of Asia, most of the rest of Asia, I should say all of it, uh, at least continental Asia, right? East and South Asia, Buddhism is a dominant religion, of course, outside of India proper. And of course, Islamic countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh. Okay, so it became the dominant religion of most of the rest of Asia, of the mainland of Asia, after long after he died. But when this was created, it was still the dominant religion in India. And it's called the early medieval period of Indian art, which is a, another golden age. You know, a lot of cultures have that, you know, which you can see throughout history, right? Rising and falling of their, you know, um, skills as artists and as their achievements as a culture of their power and wealth. Many cultures have those ups and downs and India did too. So this is, some people call it a second golden age, but I wouldn't use that phrase because that's, that's subjective. There are people who divide it up into, you know, a dozen different eras, but you can just say it was the quote, early medieval period. It's not a phrase that Westerners have foisted on Indian historians. They themselves adopted that phrase. Why? Because this is when the early middle ages was starting in Europe, which was the dark ages. There wasn't much culture or civilization of any kind in Europe at this time, but there was in India and of course China and Central America. So we just call it the early medieval period of Indian history and culture, uh, one of their early golden ages. Okay, but who was Buddha and what did he believe? So here's what I'm gonna do. I don't want your hands to fall off or if you're recording this, of course it is being recorded. It's the last time I check in, <laughs> and it will be re, uh, uh, 
play, um, placed, I'm sorry, uh, not rebroadcast. <laughs> it will be posted on, as always, all my lectures are by say, let's say eight to be safe, 8 p.m. on Friday on YouTube. But you should follow this and then I'll summarize it, okay? So who was Buddha? Well, he was a prince. Some of you know this, right? Born to a ruling class family. In fact, his father was a local ruler. The equivalent of today, we might say a governor or even even a lower level king. You know, he, he ruled over a whole you know, small kingdom and he could have just stayed in the royal palace. He had a wife and three children and some people consider this controversial. But at age 29, which does affect people sometimes turning 29, right, or 30, right, uh, he had a sudden disaffection, you could say, or um, feeling of dislocation, of disorientation is, too, is not the right word, but he just felt separated suddenly from his upbringing. He was unhappy and dissatisfied, so he left in the middle of the night without even saying goodbye or leaving a note to his wife, three children, or his father and mother and his siblings, he had a large family. He left, in other words, a life of luxury and comfort to go out into the world, and he spent five years looking around we just say several, I don't know if it was four or five years, looking around, walking all over that part of Northern India, you can just say his section of India, uh, until one day he sat down, he had tried all these other early religions. And so one day he sat down under a sacred tree, there's actually a name for it, we don't need to get that detailed, a particular kind of tree that's considered sacred, and at least it was in India, and sat there for, I, you know, I think it was a couple of days. Anyway, a long time contemplating the meaning of life. Why is there so much suffering? So the bottom line is he came up with this system. It's really not a religion. In fact, my Buddhist friends will say, we're not a religion. It makes it sound like an organized group, like, you know, Christianity or, or uh, Islam. It's not that organized. It's a way of living, a philosophy of life. And that's now the next definition you should be right now. Definitely you want to write this. I will say it slowly and repeat it. He created Buddhism as a uh, system for living and becoming enlightened. So here's the definition of Buddhism that fits what he came up with. Okay, here we go. Buddhism is a religion that began in India about 500 BC or BCE, comma. It's a long definition. There's no way to shorten it. It's four lines. There's three things about it, right? I'll say it again, the first part. Buddhism is a religion that began in India about 500 BC, comma, which teaches that there is an eightfold path to enlightenment, which teaches that there is an eightfold path to enlightenment, which includes, and I want to give you the five most important things, right thinking, you know, being correct, but the phrase they use is right, as in the word right. So right thinking, right attitude, right speech, right livelihood, and right action. Again, right thinking, right attitude, right speech, right livelihood, and right action. What that boils down to, okay, everybody got that? What that would be, now I'm going to ask you to regurgitate the definition verbatim. It might appear on the true false section of the, it will, it very likely will. And if I said, you know, true false, Buddhism teaches there's an eightfold path, including right ways to earn money. Okay, well, that would be obviously false, right? So that's the way you'll see it if it comes up on the uh, final. But the point is that he was trying to get people to stop doing things that harmed each other and themselves and even if possible, any other living creatures. Now, people had to hunt, to eat. Some parts of India, there wasn't much farming. The weather the, or the um, terrain didn't allow it. So he didn't say you should become you know, a vegetarian necessarily, although many Buddhists were and are now, but just say he believed you should avoid unnecessarily harming any other creature. But the main thing, as I know some of you have already been thinking, if you already study Buddhism, why did I mention this at the beginning is his epiphany under that tree that led to that system, that him coming up with that concept of how to live life, was this. Here's the epiphany in a nutshell, of course, simplified. The root cause of all human suffering and unhappiness 
is desire. Not even greed, because that's a form of desire, but all human desires lead to unhappiness. They lead to conflict. They lead to uh, dissatisfaction, to violence, to aggression. So again, in a nutshell, you can keep it simple. His underlying epiphany or you know, uh, belief that people needed to behave better and how, why they should, to become enlightened and, and, and understand why we're here and not be full of unhappiness and misery is that the underlying cause of human suffering, right? is desire that simple if you think about it, it makes perfect sense <laughs> of course anyway it was a message that happened to be coming along at a time when there was a lot of turmoil in india so the last part i'll say about uh, the meaning well then we're going to say two or three of the features on his body that we believe are symbolic of his teaching and that'll be the only last couple of lines you'll need to write about the meaning but just to wrap that thing up about the the philosophy and what he taught uh, at the time why it was so receptive to, uh, so well received and why India as a culture, the people of India were so receptive, including the ruling class, was they were warring with each other. There was, you know, poverty, of course, uh, and there was economic turmoil, but there was also, um, you know, hunger and, you know, violence. Some of it just uh, local, right? crime as well as of course actual wars between different uh kings basically they were warlords <laughs> these kings uh and he saw all that suffering and he thought of a way that he thought people could get past that okay so the last part of the meaning here is these are the details that we believe are accurate of how buddha actually would have looked when he was visiting a village to give his lectures on enlightenment his eyes are closed right and that means he's in a contemplative mood or, or state of mind, I think is a better phrase. Uh, he, he's thinking about the meanings of life and his philosophy and how to convey it or convince people to follow him. Another detail, this is fascinating, is a halo. Now that sounds like a Christian concept to me. Some people think of like a giant broken plate, which it is broken. The halo originally would be all the way around, of course, a very large one around the back of his head. Yes, that's supposed to be somewhat like uh, Christian saints are depicted, a halo. Uh, it's, it's a divine light that supposedly emanated from him because he was so enlightened and in close to the truth. Now, now, there's another part, you have to write this, that most of my Buddhist friends will tell me, and those that have been that you know, Buddhist all their lives really adamantly say this. We don't believe in God. There's no God, there is a state of being, which is enlightenment that you can achieve at the end or near the end of your life if you follow the teachings of Buddha. But that would lead to a kind of, uh, you know, um, what's the sacred, there we go, sacred light that is being symbolized by this broken, you could call it that, part of or portion of a halo. Another detail is his hand. Well, isn't that a symbol that everyone thinks of in Western culture is get, get back, right? Stay away. Yeah. No, just the opposite. So that a minor detail, very important about all the statues of Buddha that show him standing. And originally he was shown standing. And yes, he was physically fit. Those very heavy set fat, what do you want to call them? Rotund seated Buddhas where they're laughing and all that's not even close to what Every bit of evidence indicates Buddha didn't look anything like those later images, much more like this. Anyway, the hand raised by Buddha and later his followers indicates, join me, come closer, listen to what I have to say, and hopefully you will see that it's the way to become enlightened and to, you know, uh, overcome the suffering. And then in case you didn't already notice, he's well endowed. Yes, according to at least some of the stories. There are a lot of stories about his life and the way people perceived him when he went through all these villages throughout India for 45 years. And yes, there's evidence supposedly that this is an accurate portrayal of his physique. So he's wearing kind of a, uh, what's the word, translucent, right? Or trans, almost transparent robes. Uh, sometimes he's shown totally nude. And then finally, his hair, right, has a top knot or at the top of his head. And his ears uh, have distended earlobes. And that's just something that no one I've ever heard explains. Why Buddha, the actual original person, uh, 
the religion is, was, or the philosophy, if you want to call it that, was founded by, uh, had those two, two uh, features. Well, he did this to his own hair, perhaps, but he didn't have someone following him doing his hair. So somehow he got his hair done up that way and maybe just left it that way. And then his earlobes, I don't know the explanation of that. Maybe when he was at the palace, before he abandoned the life of luxury, he had worn some kind of heavy jewelry, but there's no evidence. Are the earlobes just large, like extremely yeah, they're large, or are they gauged, like they're, stretched? Uh, they're stretched. Oh. Yeah, they're stretched, and that is why I think it had to have something to do with his earlier life, perhaps, you know, because then we'll see why he would have done that while he was busy trying to enlighten people and living a life of chosen life of poverty. One other tip, extra credit options. You already know some of you this, and if you didn't, you'll be getting email reminding you of this. Museums are open again with limited capacity. The Asian Art Museum is a wonderful place to go to see Buddhist relics in San Francisco, of course. And they have a room full of these kinds of standing Buddha. Well, it's not only these kind of, but some seated and some standing images of Buddha, including a couple with the halo and you know the same cl close-eyed expression. So if you go to one of those museums and you show a proof of having been there this semester, you know, receipt, tickets up, you get 10 points extra credit. Okay, formal analysis. This is a cool color. Yes, this sculpture, cool gray off. Oh great color. It's got wonderful cement texture on his entire physique, uh, including his face and his hair, his hands, his feet, and that's all done with carved line. Um, it really, you could just say it's a single mass, but I guess you could break it down and say first his body and then the rope is only over his lower half of his body. You notice that? From the waist up, he's, he's uh, not wearing clothes. So you could say the, the robe I guess, if you want to call it that. And then the halo, I guess, would be the third largest. It is almost entirely stable. If the halo was complete, it'd be round, so that would be dynamic. The top of his head and the top knot are, of course, dynamic. But overall, his body and his pose is almost entirely upright, so it's primarily stable. Uh, we have modeling from the lighting of the museum. There's carved line to create to simulate the textures of his face, his hair, his skin, you know, uh, and the robe, I guess. All that's with carved line, there's no painted line. Uh, and it's totally balanced, completely symmetrical. Um, the rhythm is obvious, the repeated shapes of his arms, hands, legs, feet, face. Uh, I think, oh, in space, it's life size. It's, uh, he was a fairly tall man, at least in his earlier years. I'm sure by the time he was 80, he wasn't as tall as he was when he was uh, 35. Um, he was about uh, six feet. So most historians believe. So this this sculpture is about that, just around or nearly six feet tall, and it's life. So there is overlapping, of course. You could just say minimal, but it's on the bottom at least where his robe overlaps his legs. Okay, now we're going to look at another image of Buddha, and I'm going to go past Shiva because I want to do Hinduism after the break. Now, there's a reclining Buddha, and I'm going to go ahead and go ahead. I know I'm skipping a lot, but you'll see why I'm doing this one. There we go. So we're going to do this, and then we'll see. We might do one more and take a break. Um, this is reclining Buddha, just like it sounds. By the way, Buddha, I think a lot of people, I did too, until I started really doing research several years ago for this class, is not a single person. Buddha just means an enlightened one. So he was the, with a capital T, Buddha during his lifetime, the premier Buddha that everyone thought was the one they were supposed to learn the most from and follow the teachings uh, of very, you could be ironic and say, or silly and say, religiously follow his teachings. Faithfully is a better word, faithfully follows his teachings. Uh, so when you hear Buddha in most of the rest of the world where Buddhism is practiced, they, they don't necessarily think of the person that we think of who founded that philosophy or, or system. You can say religion if you want, because it, it's kind of an overlap with religious concepts. Um, and and uh, yet that isn't the case. Uh, it's it, the Buddha, the Buddha with a capital T, they would mean that person, the one we just described. And his name was um, actually Siddhartha. Thomas Wolfe, wasn't it Thomas Wolfe? Yeah, right, he wrote a fantastic novel. Swiss novelist, wasn't he, about the life of Buddha that was very popular in the 20s or 30s, that far back. 
and there are great biographies of them. I just finished reading another one before the semester. Okay, so remember the word Buddha is just a general term for uh, people who are uh, enlightened and teachers of that enlightenment. The Buddha with a capital T would imply the man that we're discussing today. Uh, okay, the declining Buddha. Well, this, let me give you the facts about it. I didn't actually give you the full. The location is Sri Lanka. And two words, of course, S R I and then L A N K A. Okay, and the date is circa 1200 AD. Uh, so, because there are dates before and after the Common Era, if you want to use CE or BCE, that's fine. You do need to have the dates, if any, and at least one of these slides tonight, at least one will be on uh, the final. You need to put the uh, letters that go with it, whether it's before or after the common era. Okay, so this one is is uh, after. So what are we looking at? Well, Sri Lanka, when I was growing up, it was called Ceylon, right? Some people still call it that, but that's the country now that we call Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka. It's an island nation off the southern. It's all part of the meeting off the southern tip of India. As some of you know if you looked at a map, uh, and it is predominantly Buddhist, but it's the only section of what was once, it was a part of India, the kingdoms of India for, for centuries. Um, it is the only major section of what was once the greater subcontinent or greater you know, kingdom of Italy. Uh, Italy, I said Italy. India, I apologize, sorry, um, which is still predominantly Buddhist. In other words, we've said this before, but if you didn't write it back then when I mentioned now you should, that Buddhism is very minimal presence today on the mainland of India, on the actual subcontinent itself, whereas it is the dominant religion and became the dominant religion hundreds of years after it was uh, created by Buddha, the Buddha. Uh, it spread to this island and has remained that, dom that island's dominant religion. Also, another important fact about Sri Lanka is that it's the source for the dissemination, you could say, or spreading of Buddhism throughout most of the rest of Asia, the mainland of Asia. Even though it's an island culture and it's kind of way off to the southern, you know, below the southern tip of India proper, uh, merchants, traders, monks, priests who believed in Buddha, uh, Buddhist teaching, uh, traveled all over South East Asia and then into China and brought Buddhism with them. It's the single most responsible that country, that island, I should say, it was not a country back then, but the island of Sri Lanka was the single uh, largest source of the spread of Buddhism beyond India. There we go. From there to the rest of uh, the mainland of Asia. Okay, but this doesn't tell us what we're looking at. This is a gigantic figure, of course carved in stone. It's one of three massive sculptures of Buddha, uh, which are lying sideways, and they are over uh, 40 feet long. It doesn't give the exact length, I'm surprised, but I know from other books that I've read, though it, I don't have one in front of me here, but just say it's over 40 feet long. It's probably closer to 50 feet, so say between 40 and 50 feet, and there are three of them. This is the one that's best preserved, and the reason for that, you see these holes here in the walls? You don't have to mention them in your notes, but they indicate that it was once housed in a wooden um, a superstructure, which protected it from the elements. But of course, this is old enough that wood in a climate like, you know, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, you know, India, any of those hot, humid places, wood is going to disintegrate in a few centuries. So the, the wooden... If I say shed, it sounds kind of downbeat, doesn't it? It wasn't a shed. It was a superstructure that once housed and protected, this sculpture uh, has decayed and disappeared. But the stone is granite. That's important detail, too. And that, luckily, is the chosen stone for this. And the other two also nearby are granite. These three giant reclining Buddhas are all of granite, and that's why they've survived in such good shape. And the other reason is there's no... Um, <clears throat> um, ISIS, right? No Islamic State uh, terrorists to try and blow it up. They, as you know, right? They blew up the giant Buddhas in uh, Afghanistan. Um, the Taliban did actually while they ruled Afghanistan. 
I call that a crime against humanity. Destroy someone else's religious relics just because you disagree with them. Anyway, this survived because everyone there, the majority anyway, the vast, vast majority, it's like 85, 90 percent. Uh, the rest are mostly uh, Muslim. Uh, and there was something like 5 percent of Sri Lanka are Christians from, from what I've read. Uh, but the vast majority being Buddhist, of course, they, they often uh, come here to meditate or worship. You could say worship. It's more of a Christian concept, but you know, to think about the life of Buddha, his teachings, and how they can live up to his teachings to become enlightened. But another fact about it that's is why is it reclining? Um, so now we've seen, you know, two different uh, types of poses, because this is symbolic of him at the end of his life, when he had achieved enlightenment, all what well, he already had, when he was ready to achieve nirvana, the state of total enlightenment, which is the next stage after this life. I know some people would think, isn't that just another word for heaven? But not really. It's a state of, you know, transcendence, which after you die, you give up yourself, right? Supposedly, according to many religious uh, traditions, but especially to Buddhism, that you wouldn't need to think of yourself as, you know, maintaining your personality, your, your, your consciousness, your individuality, that goes into a broader realm of general enlightened state of being or nirvana. That's one word for it. Yes, uh, my daughter's favorite band from the 90s. <laughs> she plays her songs on uh, car stereo all the time. Anyway, uh, they, they took that name, of course, from that concept of Buddhism that you can uh, pass into an enlightened, uh, ultimate state of enlightenment after you die. So this is supposed to be him just before he died, maybe a few days. He was sick for quite a while before he died, by the way, for several weeks. But he still went out and preached or, or lectured until I think the last two days he was too sick to do that. And his faithful companion who was with him his whole adult life, went with him everywhere, uh, tended to him, and uh, was the one with him when he died. So this, this is a, an image of how he might have been. You see the contentment on his face? I mean, that sort of tells you he felt that he had achieved all the things he needed to while he was on this earth in this life, and that he was going to become fully enlightened, right? The ultimate state of enlightened or near, to achieve nirvana. Okay, so that's the meaning here. This is balanced. Yes, uh, it is. If you drew a line either way, you know, this way down around the waist or across the length, it, it balanced as a full human physique would be. Top to bottom, left to right. Uh, the largest mass, it's one mass. I mean, I don't think you can break it down, right? It's a single large mass. For space, it's, it's a colossal is the right word. You just say, much larger than life or gigantic in scale, but the right word is colossal. Just write that how it sounds, which implies either twice or more than twice life size. Well, it's way more than twice life size. This is about uh, eight or 10 times. So just say that it is for space, it's a real three dimensional object that is between 40 and 50 feet long. Okay, uh, and then we have, is it stable or dynamic? Well, that's a little harder to say because lying like this, but his head's on a pillow, obviously. So he, uh, he has a tilt and his hips, of course, rise like that. So it's, it's both. But overall, it's much more horizontal overall than the, the pose itself, the, the, the line of his physique, of his uh, torso and legs. So I'd say it's more stable than dynamic with lots of dynamic uh, details, but you can decide that. There isn't any modeling except the natural sunlight, the shadows from the sun. There is semi texture as well as the real texture of the granite from carved line, of course, especially visible on, look at his hair there again. Uh, and I think this one, the top knot has been worn off or it's not as visible, but that's how he's usually portrayed. So just say on his head, his face particularly, and of course his hands and his feet all have good cement texture, very realistic. Um, this must have taken years to carve with carved line. The color is cool gray, right? Um, texture modeling. Rhythm, uh, yeah, rhythm, I guess I didn't mention. Rhythm, of course, would be the repeated shapes of uh, the details on his face, his arms, hands, legs, and feet. Okay, so I think, let me take a look, see if there's another Buddhist. I think it makes a convenient break to then do all of the Hindu slides uh, after the break. And I believe 
yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to go back so that I'm ready to do it when we start again. And we'll take our break in just a minute or two, but uh, stay with me here just so that when we start again, we're all on literally the same, whoops, there it is, page. So this will be our uh, next must know. And let's go ahead and take our break since it's almost 7.55. Let's call it 7.55. So until uh, 10 after, and we will end early tonight, probably as early as uh, 20, 25 minutes. But don't go away because there, there is a very strong likelihood of one of the slides of the Hindu art from after the break being on the final. Okay, gonna pause the recording. I'll see you guys in 15 minutes, about 18. Okay, um, welcome back. And uh, like I said, we're gonna end quite a bit earlier than usual. Oh, at least 20 minutes early tonight, but we do have four more must knows and they are all uh, about Hinduism, um, which is our first definition. Uh, in fact, there is only that <clears throat> one remaining new definition for tonight is on your, your list of terms to know. Uh, okay, so this is uh, one that you'll want to know from uh, possibly will appear on the true false section of the final. <laughs> okay. And this one isn't quite as long a definition as Buddhism, but it is not short either. So about two lines. Here we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hinduism is a religion that began in India about 2000 BC or BCE, comma. Again, a religion that began in India about 2000 BC which believes in a multitude of deities that can transform themselves from a spiritual state into a gross body state. I'll say that again in the second part. Uh, which believes in a multitude of deities that can transform themselves from a spiritual state into a gross body state period in other words they can go back and forth between the spiritual world and this world or you know the mundane everyday world of life on earth they can become physically manifested in front of any of their believers or followers on earth or they most of the time uh, when they choose to they come down to earth if you want to look at it that way but it's more of just manifesting themselves physically on earth. But most of the time they're in a spiritual state, meaning they're not, you know, physical. They're part of the universe. The multitude of deities is a pretty accurate way to say. There are hundreds of uh, Hindu deities. And we're going to only talk about uh, really the main one, the most important one. So that's the first, this slide, for instance, is the first and most important. Well, it's the first must know, of course, obviously, of Hindu art for tonight, but it's also the most important, an image of the most important god of the Hindu religion. According to many Hindus, this, this uh, god will describe why is the most important and powerful of all Hindu deities. Okay, so here's the title of this slide. Eternal Shiva, that's S-H-I-V-A, from Cave Temple. Again, Eternal Shiva from cave temple location, of course, India. And the date of this is circa 500 BC. So Hinduism was well established by this time. In fact, if you, you know, remember from before the break, you were following the, your notes, uh, that, that's about the same time Buddha was alive, but in a very different part of India. He, he was up in the Northern part, just below the Himalaya mountains and his uh, kingdom he was born and raised in where his father was a ruler. And he grew up um, was basically the foothills almost of the Himalayas, not literally, but right at, at the edge of the Himalayas. And so this is from a, a southern part of India, and it's an area of India, but which by this time, 500 or several, you get to say several centuries BC, uh, Hinduism had been well established for centuries, and it also was in a golden age of its artistic creativity. And that is reflected in this tradition, a Hindu, specifically Hindu tradition of carving 
entire cave systems, you could say, or, you know, complex is a better word, complexes of caves below ground or into mountainsides, either one, which would then become temples for worship, for Hindu worshiping uh, Hindu deities. And the primary one was Shiva. This is from one of those cave temples which goes down into the earth. So it would be cooler, of course, you know, it's quite hot in India, of course, uh, most of the time, certainly you know, warmer months of the year. So this would be a, a more comfortable uh, uh, way of, um, you know, uh, providing a, a religious ceremonial space. So these religious ceremonial spaces or, or Hindu temples, not all of them, but many of them during this period, several hundred years BC, uh, it was a golden age of Hindu art, were carved out of the rock of the walls, right, of these caves. So this is why we have the title for this slide of um, Eternal Shiva from Cave Temple. But who was Shiva? Well, once again, I'll repeat that. Just say many Hindus, it's hard to say most, but many Hindus consider Shiva the most powerful of all and most important, therefore, of all of the Hindu deities. And I'm going to use a phrase that I've used for years, believe it or not, even before it became sort of the norm or whatever common usage of they, not he or she, because Shiva is both male and female and yet neither simultaneously, and I'll show you the evidence of that in this, this uh, slide. So to say he, which is understandable, Stockstead, the edition I have several years old, is a little misleading. But so would saying she, because Shiva has both, in other words, how to write that is male and female aspects, which have to do with the power this God um, wields over the universe, not just over earth, but over the whole universe, according to Hindu religious belief. So how is this larger than life, roughly twice, you know, human life size, so it's about 12 feet tall. How does this image of their most powerful, one of the most powerful gods, uh, evoke those aspects of the god Shiva? Well, Shiva, or they, has three heads in this image. Some show Shiva with four or even five heads, but always at least with three. So we'll just focus on the three. Why three? Because Shiva has power over, as I said, the whole universe, the power of what? The power of destruction and creation, of life and death, and of creativity and negativity. In other words, the opposites, you know, everyone knows the phrase, right? Yin and yang, the yin and yang of, of the universe or certain religious beliefs. And of course, the flag of South Korea, if you've never seen it, right? Oh, um, that symbolic of that, you know, and my daughter's favorite K-pop groups, right? On their album covers, I guess, or somewhere on their websites have that image, you know, the yin and the yang, right? The, 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 the two opposite aspects or op opposite um, types of, you know, concepts in the universe in relation to what specifically the polar opposites of life and death Shiva has power for both of those over creation the forces of creation and destruction in the universe and over creativity and negativity and there's a lot of other ways that Shiva has powers over uh, all of these polar opposite forces in the universe so of course that would make this a very powerful god but the front face is the most common image shown facing forward. And that is indicative. Look at the big, large, almost hypnotically staring eyes. That's part of the meaning of this slide. And the protruding uh, mouth or lips. That's symbolic of the forceful inner nature of Shiva. And Shiva at this point is uh, also in the front image of the face face that's facing forward there we go forward facing image of shiva has a very prominent crown which is taller than the crowns on either other side it's a massive i would even write it that way massive crown and very very highly ornamented with the jewelry you know and all kinds of decorative decorations carved into it symbolic of the power and importance of this god uh, of shiva 
The other two heads are symbolic of the, again, yin and yang, the male and female, sorry, male here and female aspects of Shiva's uh, persona, you could say, or um, powers. The female, I think you probably can tell, is the one in this image to our right, but it would be on, always shown on the left shoulder, a head on the left shoulder of Shiva is symbolic of the female aspect of Shiva's powers, which is the power over birth, specifically birth, life, growth, and creativity. Again, according to Hindu teaching, associated with female aspects of female persona that, as they perceive, uh, were associated or tied together with those kinds of forces, both in human existence and in the universe. Again, a powers this female face on the left shoulder, symbolic of the female aspects of Shiva, which would mean that its powers or their powers over creativity, life, birth, and um, the positive aspects of the universe. This is the male, of course, on the right shoulder head symbolic of the wrathful, vengeful, destructive, violent aspect. Now it's ironic associating that with, well, has the word toxic masculinity come to mind? Anyway, don't don't write that. But well, you could actually, you could, because they're implying that here over 2,500 years ago, that, that those things are often much more associated, if not almost always, at least in Hindu belief, with male aspects of uh, you know, both individual human beings or human society and in the universe in general. So that's pretty much the whole meaning of this. This, this is uh, still there. This whole complex of caves goes way back into the, the mountainside. And there are other carved sculptures of other uh, Hindu deities. And I believe more than one image of Shiva, but you don't have to know for sure if there are. Just focusing on this being the most prominent one. And it's probably the largest and certainly the most uh, detailed and you would have to pass by this image of Shiva and you would stop and pray or meditate however you want to say that in front of the statue if you were coming to that temple to worship or to contemplate anything to meditate as a Hindu faithful member of the Hindu religion now that is a religion not not a philosophy okay they also believe in enlightenment we'll talk about that with one of the last two slides uh, in fact these is the last slide we're going to see which is one, I will tell you, not this one necessarily, it may or may not be cut from the study list, but the last slide of Shiva we're going to see is really important, and that one won't be cut, so you, I'll tell you when we get to it. All right, so wrapping up this with the formal analysis, it is balanced, of course, with the two heads of equal size on either side, and, uh, you know, the complete torso, if you could, you'd see the whole body of Shiva, you just see the upper part, of course, here in this photo. Uh, is, is, is a balance left to right. You could make the case it's unbalanced at the bottom because the shoulders are very broad, even more so than most human bodies would be. Uh, and the heads, all three even being put together are narrower than the shoulders. So you could say it's unbalanced toward the bottom. It's got similar texture on the crowns. All three have crowns. The jewelry, the necklace here, the faces. That's all done with carved line, but it also has the real rough texture of the stone. I'm not sure what kind of stone, but it's rough. It is cool as it looks here. It's a kind of cool off gray color. No warm colors here. It is both stable and dynamic. Uh, the actual pose and even all the way up to the top of the crown and the pose of the, at least the head facing forward is upright, straight, dead on, looking straight at the viewer and the body is posed straight upright. But obviously there are a lot of dynamic details on the crowns and the two heads that are tilted downward on the side. So it's both stable and dynamic. There's no technique for modeling. After all, this was in a cave where there was no light at all unless someone brought a torch in. So it's just the shadows from, not the sun, you wouldn't see the sun here. So, so from torchlight or artificial light, you could say. Because now I, I know it must be electrified, this cave would have to be if it's still being, and it is still being used as a, a house of, a kind of house of worship or temple, a uh, cave temple. So artificial lighting creates modeling. Uh, and then we have um, the largest mass. Well, is it one mass? So if you want to break it down, then it's in this image, the head of the forward facing right image of Shiva. And then the second largest masses are about equal of the male and female aspects or heads on either shoulder. 
Although you could say the shoulders almost look as, 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 as large as those two heads, but you only see the upper part. So you decide on that. <clears throat> and then the rhythm is obvious with the repeated shapes of the, the tops of their heads, the faces, the eyes, nose, mouth, and of course the necklace. Okay, so let's move on to the next must know. And we're going to um, skip several in the middle, but this is an important one. Actually, this is one I'm not going to cut from the study list. So there are two more. I'm sorry, I should say that. That doesn't mean that either one will definitely be this in the very last slide on the final, but have a high possibility and they won't be removed when we do the review for the study list. All right, so this one is uh, Kandaria Mahadeva Temple. I know that's a mouthful, so I'll spell these two words slowly twice. Kandaria, first word, K A N D A R. I Y A. Okay, and then the second word is Mahadeva. If you say it slowly and pronounce it phonetically, it should be easier to spell. But again, you have these syllabi to look at during your writing your answers, so it shouldn't be too hard. Mahadeva is M A H A D E V A. Kandriya Mahadeva Temple, of course, India, circa 1000 AD. Now, this is from the late medieval period of Indian art and culture. And it's another one of those golden ages. They went through some, just like with every culture, there was a period of chaos and violence and wars between the different warlords and kingdoms all over India uh, after around, I think it was 600. So just say, you know, after the early medieval period, there was a period of, um, you know, decline, at least in terms of the quality of life and stability of their society. And then there was a unifying under, I think it was just one or two kings that conquered you know, most of their uh, cities in, in India at that time and unified enough that they had a peace, a period, I mean, of peace and stability. And that's when this was. It's just, again, the, the term is universally applied by historians. It has nothing to do with just the Middle Ages of Europe. So it's called the late medieval period. This was created. And it is a Southern, is in the Southern half of India, Southern style temple. So what is it? Well, it's a kind of stupa. And this one is a Hindu stupa. Remember I said stupa could be either a Hindu or Buddhist house of worship. So uh, the same concept applies, but you might say a large central dome, where is it? What are you talking about? Well, look carefully, because what you have here is the largest single elongated, some call it pulled. I always think of taffy when I hear the word pulled. You know, like saltwater taffy at the um, boardwalk in Santa Cruz. Don't write that. It has the pulled upward dimensions, though, of an elong. I prefer the word elongated dome. This is the main dome, and it's the room in which you would walk around, right, in a clockwise direction. Actually, if you look at it this way, it would be like that, right? Uh, if you walked into that room, a uh, collection of religious relics. You don't have to write all that. You already have the definition of stupa. This, this qualifies as a stupa. It's just a very different a style of one. Southern Indian from the late medieval period where they had these elongated domes. Because then you've got another set of three successively shorter or, or, or smaller domes over each of these ceremonial rooms. So you can describe these as... Uh, rooms for religious ceremonial practices. What would those be? Dancing, singing, literally, these are the main ones, dancing, you know, and of course, a sacred, you know, ceremony to worship one of the Hindu gods or, or several of them. Dancing, singing, meditation, right? Uh, or even simple uh, reciting, right? You're reciting a, a Hindu prayer, recitation, you could say, or reciting of prayers. So the, all of those activities went on to different degrees at different times in each of these um, ceremonial rooms, which are covered or you could say sheltered, right, above by, and these are domes. If you were to stand there and look up, you'd see a uh, not hollow, but, uh, you know, well, in a way it is, you, you know, open all the way up to the top here, each of these, all well, four of them. So these are actually domes, but the main dome is the one with the collection of relics at the back and the largest room, of course, for those relics. And then you have the fact that this is, uh, this picture is better than one in the textbook. I'm glad to see that. 
that the entire structure is resting on a platform where well, you can't quite tell that here. Yeah, you can when you back up. I guess when you get it large, you can't see that. Hang on, I'm gonna try this again. Yeah, you can. You see that there? That's just the very minimal edges of a, a platform. And it's not a minor point, it's a major part of the meaning that Hindu temples, at least Hindu ones, not uh, uh, Buddhist ones, rest on a stone platform, or you could say base, but platforms would be a better word which is symbolic of, now this should sound familiar, because the Buddhist had the same idea, but they did it with uh, railings. So that these platforms on which the larger, at least major Hindu temples would be resting, were meant to separate, right? To be symbolic of the separation again of the sacred space of the temple from the mundane everyday world around it. So it's not a minor point. Also on those platforms would be mandalas. And I actually forgot, you guys are getting a break, to write that as a definition. So you don't have to think of it as something that will appear as you know a uh, true false question on, it won't, because it's not on your list of terms to know. But I will go ahead and tell you, because in this slide, it's part of the meaning just for this slide. A mandala, not to be confused with a man named Mandela, who liberated South Africa from apartheid, not that spelling, it's mandala, M-A-N-D-A-L-A, -A -A, um, is a um, diagram of the cosmos created out of natural local materials such as sand, earth, stones, twigs, and other natural items. Again, it's a, you don't have to write the full definition, but you can, just how it seems, you know, summarize it in your own words. It's a kind of cosmic diagram meant to symbolize, again, the whole concept of yin and yang, right? And the uh, balancing forces of positive, negative, destructive, and creative forces in the universe. And it, these were made by the monks or, or priests, Hindu priests, who maintained these uh, and lived in or near, I actually didn't live in, I'm sorry, I meant near these temples. They would create these mandalas and then they would just destroy them and make a new one every few weeks. My friends who have been to India describe watching that happen. So these platforms had a dual purpose, primarily symbolic of the separation between sacred space the temple represents and the mundane world all around. And secondarily to support, a, it would be more than one at any time, probably several mandalas or diagrams of the universe, the cosmos is the other way to say it. And those were made out of natural materials from right there on the site you know, dirt, sand, pebbles or rocks, twigs and so forth, leaves, things that could be arranged in a pattern to be symbolic of the yin and the yang of the universe. Okay, uh, that's pretty much the whole meaning, although, oh yeah, you do want one more thing. This structure is, we talked about this when I showed you the slides of Stonehenge, yeah, there we go, that shows it, is the oldest construction method known to the human race, which is posts and lintels. And these projecting porches, which of course are out a part of the room, expanded sections of those ceremonial rooms. Uh, and it gives them more room for more people to say, and of course, it could even have a wedding in, in one of these rooms, obviously with a you know, reasonably oh, modest sized wedding party, perhaps a few dozen people. Anyway, the point is these ceremonial, religious ceremonial rooms are expanded by the use of these projecting porches, which are then roofed and the space above them the decorative, well, I call it detail that is. The carving on this is literally just uh, incredible. I've, I have a friend who took slides when they were there. Actually, it was Sarah Gill, sorry, but she is a friend, who wrote one of the two textbooks who lives not too far from Berkeley. Yeah, she went to India when I was still, she was still teaching here and I had just started at the JC. And her slides, I went to one of her lectures of this, were fascinating. Yeah, she actually got to join a religious ceremony in one of these rooms. But anyway, the point is it's richly ornamented. The last two facts about the meaning on this slide is that these kinds of uh, late medieval temples in Southern India, the Southern style, were always, besides the elongated domes, they had richly decorated facades where almost every square inch, you can see that, was carved with figures of deities or sacred animals. And then they also had projecting porches, which the roofs of which or the overhanging, you know, awnings of those porches were supported by post and lintel construction. Again, the oldest form of architecture known to the human race. Okay, that's planning on the meaning of this formal analysis. This is a warm color, this is what it looks like, a sand color. 
And uh, it's uh, the symbiotic texture is obvious with all those figures of uh, sacred images of deities and, and sacred animals. Uh, but you can also tell the rough texture of the stone is more visible down at the bottom, the base of it, the foundation, and on the tops of these elongated, uh, well, especially this elongated dome. For space, this is over 100 feet, but just a slightly, or to say about or slightly over 100 feet from the foundation to the top of the tallest dome. So it's, and then the others are successively smaller. This is about 75, 70 feet or so. You have to know that. But just this one you should mention, the actual dimensions. I don't know the width of the rooms. You, you don't have to write that. Uh, but the rhythm is obvious. The repeated elongated domes with their finials. That's actually a good word to know, but I'm not going to hold you to that. Yeah, look at this uh, sacred uh, animal here. It looks like a horse. I'm not sure. It's hard to tell from this distance. But these are urns, which are almost the universal symbol, right, of uh, the fact that some people prefer cremation after death and or enlightenment that we might achieve in the next life. Um, because they do believe in enlightenment, but they have a different belief in other than what Buddha taught. It's not like follow his path, the Eightfold Path. There's different ways to get it. We don't have to go into that. Of course, we don't have time. Uh, this one's missing, the finial here, but they all would have had those originally. And so, of course, that creates rhythm as do the porches and all the thick carved figures. Uh, again, carved line is everywhere. There's no painted line here. And the largest mass is the tallest dome. The most, you know, uh, tallest uh, elongated dome at the far uh, left. Uh, and then the next largest, obviously, is the middle one here. And then the one next to it. Um, and it is dynamic on the domes and uh, stable on the bottom. Uh, everything from about the top of the, the roof of the porches below is pretty entirely upright. So that's all stable. Uh, even the figures carved on them. But everything above that begins to taper, right? And uh, ends with, you know, a, either point or a finial. And uh, the, the decorations here are, you know, mixed of dynamic and stable. So it's both, but more dynamic above the porches and less more stable underneath them. Modeling is part of the design here because of the heat and the, the you know rather relentless sun in you know India. It's important to have shelter, uh, and that's what these uh, ceremonial rooms with their roofed porches provide. So that modeling is part of the design here. The deep shadows, which are created by the sun, of course. Um, and then let's see rhythm balance texture, modeling. Oh, is it balanced? I didn't say. Well, that's depending on how you look at it. If you were to stand here, I've seen the slides, like I said, Sarah Gill actually showed us in one of her lectures many years ago. Uh, this is symmetrical. If you drew a line down the middle, you know, cut it, this whole temple right in half, left to right, it would be balanced. Definitely. Here, it doesn't look balanced. So if you want to write it that way, if this is on the exam, it'll be the slide, you'll see. You could call it unbalanced toward the uh, left, of course, because of the weight and height of the tallest dome. Um, and of course, it is balanced, unbalanced toward the bottom when you look at it that way, obviously, because of the uh, width of the base compared to the tops of the domes. Okay. All right. Let's move on. We're doing really well on time here. <clears throat> oh, I did. You don't have to write any more. But this is an interesting detail here of these, again, fertility figures. And I don't think I need to get too graphic here. I probably should have paused here. But it's in the Stockstad textbook. So it is part of the history. If you don't know what the Kama Sutra is, you could look it up, right? But it's a, a very ancient and well-known Hindu text about human procreation and various aspects of it. And that's sort of what we are seeing some aspects of that here, obviously. But these are actually supposedly deities that are symbolic or maybe inspiring a human appropriation. Okay, we're skipping the other. I don't want to show you too many buildings that look a lot alike. So we're, we've got uh, two more and one of them is really fascinating. And this is, it will be one that uh, I had seen from, oh, that is the, the one again, I guess. There, you don't have to write this, but there's your, your traditional early era stupa, you know, the earliest stupas that we saw the first uh, stupa slide of. And then we have this one here, yeah. These on the side there. The later ones with the elongated 
both northern and southern ones use those along here. Okay, let's go to descent of the Ganges. Sorry about the placement of I thought it was before this. Actually, it is. <laughs> All right, you guys get to see another quick. All right. Yeah, if I could, there we go. This is not uninteresting, I think, for all of you. It's it's actually one of the most uh, evocative sites in India, according again, to, other than the Taj Mahal, obviously, uh, which we don't cover because that's later than the period we cover. If you take Art 1.2, uh, you would see it then in that class. Okay, so here we go. The second to the last must know is the descent of the Ganges. D-E-S-C-E-N-T, right? The word descent to go down of the Ganges. That's G-A-N-G-E-S. You may know this. If you don't, you should write it. The Ganges is the most sacred river in India. It isn't the longest. That's the Indus, which, by the way, forms almost, not quite, but close to what the border now between the two nations of Pakistan and India are. Uh, so it's on the, that river's way over towards the far uh, <clears throat> west end of India. But the Ganges runs down pretty much through central India. It's one of their largest rivers, but it is what's important to remember or put in your notes is the most sacred river to Hindus. If you are a faithful Hindu, a devout believer in Hinduism, you wherever you live, you're supposed to make at least one pilgrimage to India in your life. And if you're in India, it's a big country. It's not always easy to get all the way across if you're, you know, poor working class family. But you're supposed to, you and your family, make at least one trip to the uh, mouth, it's not the mouth, the head of the Ganges, near near the, the, the source of it, and descend the whole river down towards the mouth of the river, uh, all the way if you can. Of course, that would mean you either have to make, build, rent, borrow, or join someone who has some kind of boat, right, or raft. I've, I've seen slides of people doing, I mean, videos of people doing, it could be, it could be on a raft. Uh, some people even use canoes, right, uh, and, or, or, or different kinds of boats, could even be larger boats with multiple passengers. But in any case, the bottom line is it's a sacred pilgrimage, just like, as you know, almost every religion has that belief, um, Jews are supposed to go to Jerusalem, right? Muslims to Mecca, Catholics to Rome, right? It's, you see how common this is, and, and it's in that vein. It's a sacred duty of all practicing Hindus that they are supposed to do that once, at least in their lifetime. And if it's a family, then they should go together as a family to do that. Okay, so that's what this is. This is supposed to be symbolic of the Ganges River, the crevice down the middle. And this is a sandstone cliff. So this is a rock cut formation, which is particularly ornate and intricate. And I'm going to show you a little bit of the details in a minute. But let's start with the most obvious facts, which is that these are multiple deities, Hindu deities, including Shiva and other minor and major Hindu deities or gods, you could say. Um, and then here's the stupa. You see with the earlier form of more like a traditional dome, not elongated. But the sacred animals are the part that I think the most fascinating and that really make this work of art stand out. Now you can see it wasn't finished and there's a theory that the, the, the town or village that was hiring the sculptors to do this had a sudden disaster, you know, like a plague uh, of locusts maybe or an actual plague. <laughs> Right. Or, you know, fire or drought, you know, starvation, famine, what have you. We don't know. It just they abandoned the project before finishing it. Obviously, this is the unfinished section. But they did enough that it's really fascinating. Again, um, I'll go ahead and say friend, my friend Sarah, when she came back from her trip to India several years ago, we got this over 20 years ago. She she was more impressed by this than any other site except the Taj Mahal, of course. OK. Elephants are sacred animals, of course, in India. If, if it's not obvious, you didn't already know that. But so are cats. I love this, being a cat owner my whole life. We only have one now, but we've had as many as three here uh, at our house. Uh, this cat, and these are mice, 
is doing a dance to hypnotize the mice and get them to run into the Ganges and drown themselves. So it's like they're depending, of course, it's symbolic of the fact that mice vermin, right, overran many villages as they still do in many parts, not in this country too, of course. In Chicago, where I grew up, there were rats in the building where I lived. Well, luckily, they'd get into our apartment. But anyway, the point is they were they're terrible, right, to have, to live with. So. So this is symbolic of the fact that a cat, maybe a minor kind of sacred animal, but nonetheless an important one, can rid a village of all of their vermin, at least for a while, the rats, by leading them to into the river to drown. Here we have a snake goddess, and then another sacred animal, which I'm going to go back and you can see it more clearly. Several, actually, of the cobras here are visible, but particularly, and some of the uh, deities are half, right, uh, you, you know, like human top half and uh, snake like lower half. Uh, and this even evokes the image of the head of a cobra as a kind of halo behind this deity's head. So you've got sacred images of animals like cats, cobras, elephants, and then you have gods and goddesses because some of them do have full fully female or, or uh, male personas uh and and uh, also a house of worship stupa literally is here with uh, an image perhaps of one of the other deities it could it could be buddha but i doubt it i doubt it this this is a very when this was created uh india had uh, no it wouldn't be buddha it wouldn't be but well let's see the day was possible because Buddhism had come and pretty much was waning by this time. So you can just say this is, yeah, it is. It's, it's a strictly Buddhist site. 674 AD. If it was BC, it wouldn't be Buddhist, of course, because he wasn't born yet. Okay, so it is during the period of when um, Hinduism had reemerged as the dominant and has stayed that way ever since religion of uh, India. And this is early medieval period too, by the way. We've talked about early and later medieval eras of the art and culture in India. This is from the earlier medieval period, one of their golden ages. Uh, and then we have some human figures. This is just a, a woman dancing in some ceremonial role, perhaps, you know, as a high priestess in a religious ceremony. And there are other dancers here too. Whoops, sorry, I meant to show you up here. Look at this row of dancers coming across the top. It's just a fascinating work. It took many years, some think generations to create this. Because, uh, yeah, let's go one more time up here, and you can see again both human figures, right? Uh, and uh, various gods and goddesses, like the ones, especially down near the river, the crevice in the middle is symbolic of the Ganges, the sacred river banks of the Ganges. Okay. All right. Um, so, formal analysis. Well, let's start with it's warm, it's a sand color because it's sandstone. Then we have the real rough texture of the sandstone and the elephants show that even more, but even there you've got the simulated texture. Look how well done the details of the elephant's face, trunk, ears, it's wonderful. And each of the human and uh, sacred figures, the deities and the humans worshiping. Uh, and so you've got carved line to create simulated texture on all the human and animal and sacred figures. The rhythm is obvious with the bodies of the dancers the gods and goddesses, the elephants, powerful rhythms. Is it more stable than dynamic? That's a little harder to say, but I would say certainly you do see stability in the elephants' poses. Not, well, more so the, 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 the papa elephant. That's what my daughter would have called this. The male elephant, uh, that would be the female, and then the, the baby, of course. Um, but there is some dynamic quality too to the, all the dancers on the upper levels, pretty much all of the human figures. And yet here, the stupa is stable, and and the the uh, gods here that are kind of upright, at least the upper bodies. Are, so it's a mixture, but more dynamic than stable. Uh, there's modeling. This part of the design here, the modeling is the shadows from the sun meant to. Uh, it's a bow relief, right? The figures raised off of a flat background, obviously. So there is modeling as part of the design. For, si uh, for space, you have overlapping is the only technique. The elephants are life-size and the human figures are life-size too, by the way. Uh, and they overlap the background or each other, as you can see. It, some of them are smaller than life-size, but the majority are life-size. 
Um, and then we have the largest mass. Well, I guess it's the, the uh, male elephant and then the female adult, female. And then from there, it's hard to say, probably the stupa because it actually has a base now. All right, uh, and the carved line, balance, is it balanced? Well, the rock faces are, right? Roughly the same size on either side of the crevice, the middle line. But if you're looking at the composition, it's unbalanced, of course, because of the unfinished portion on the uh, left side, it's unbalanced toward the right. Uh, and top to bottom, I guess you'd have to say unbalanced toward the top for that same reason. Okay, we have one more must know. So let's take a look at that. And uh, we have to, there's, there's the map I was trying to show you earlier. There's where Buddha practiced and lived here, Sanchi. Uh, and then some of the, look at that, Elephanta, the name of one of the cities after. Now, Delhi is an ancient city. New Delhi is the current capital, but there was a city before that from which New Delhi took its name. And these were Roman trading outposts. And here's Sri Lanka, the island. Uh, down below off the southern tip of India. Let's go back to our very last one and we'll still end pretty early here and then I'll stick around for any, oh, there it is, questions you have. This is an important one. I'm not cutting it from the study list. Okay, it's Shiva from Tamil Nadu. Shiva, again, I've spelled well, I'll spell it again, S-H-I-V-A from Tamil, that's T-A-M, two words, T-A-M-I-L, second word, N-A-D-U. That's a, a region of southern India, India, circa 1100 AD. So this is also from the uh, late medieval period of Indian art and culture that we've been talking about. Uh, and another, in other words, era of uh, high quality and high level of, of skill or achievement uh, in Indian art. So again, it's a golden age. We've already talked about Shiva was, I'm going to repeat in summary a little bit about it because those aspects we talked about with the cave uh, sculpture of Shiva in the cave temple are not shown the same way here. So let's talk about, again, the fact that Shiva is neither male nor female, or you could say is both or neither. So again, I would say they. Shiva here is shown in a pose, a dance-like pose, right? which is again, symbolic of the, you could say yin and yang, if you want in your notes, that makes perfect sense of the opposing forces of the universe, which Shiva has power over. Again, those being, I'll repeat those again briefly, life and death, right? Uh, destruction, sorry, and creativity, right? Of uh, positive and negative energy, right? and uh, birth or birth and growth and death and decay. I know it's all the, all the symbol, I'm sorry, all the forces in the universe that are uh, uh, opposing forces, contrasting forces is why Shiva is so powerful and is considered again, the most powerful by most Hindus that I've ever say anything about. Shiva is the most powerful and important and therefore influential of all the Hindu deities. And the symbolism here we'll get up close is slightly different than the image in the textbook. So I don't know why this slide is what the file that Stockstead you know, sends to teachers to use sometimes is slightly different, but it is still the same symbolism. So the fire, you see this supposed to be flames on the outer edge of this the circle of flames is symbolic of the forces of, of course, destruction in the universe, right? The power of the ability to destroy even the universe itself. Shiva supposedly has that much power. Now here you only see the forward facing image on the, on the head, right? But it would be implied, you don't see it, that there are two other faces, one on either side. And actually, I believe this one, if you walk around behind it, would have an image facing the back. Uh, some of them had four faces, as I mentioned. So just say that there is only one visible face here, but Shiva is always conceived of as having at least three faces. And again, the ones on either side, one represents usually, the, well, it is always the one on the left shoulder represents female powers of creativity, birth, life, right? Positive 
energy and the male one on the right shoulder, again, always the symbolic in Hindu religion of powers of destructive uh, forces in the universe of death and destruction. And uh, we could even say chaos uh, and violence. Okay, and now the body, the pose of the rest of the body of the legs is a balancing act, quite literally, you can see that, that this, this God, this deity, has multiple arms, but only two legs. And Shiva is balanced on a dwarf. And the dwarf is supposed to be symbolic of the forces of create of not creation. That's, I'm sorry, that would be slightly misleading, of becoming. That's how the text describes it and what I've read about it. Is in other words, that transformation from nothingness into existence of the earth of you know the land and the, the sea you know mountains and deserts all, all the things that make up this planet and then by extension the other planets all over the universe it's symbolized in this in every other statue i've seen a lot of statues of uh, the shiva not just in the san francisco museum of asian art there are a lot of them there but in you know, other cities and other museums always shiva is standing uh, in the middle of a ring of fire, symbolic of the force of destruction, that she is holding it, or he or they is holding at bay, right, and controlling, keeping them from getting out of control and destroying the universe. That's why you would pray to Shiva, because <laughs> that's who's saving us all from full, complete universal breakdown, you know, of the entire uh, cosmos. And then is also always shown, Shiva is always shown standing on the back of a dwarf, which is supposed to be symbolic of Shiva controlling the processes of becoming, becoming, transitioning from nothingness into existence, whatever that is, you know, for the human race, for other species, animals on the planet Earth, for the, as I just said, for the Earth itself, for other planets. So it's symbolic of, again, that massive power that this single deity has over all the important forces in the universe basically and then these are not this is not really a halo but these are rays of divine light or energy somewhat like a halo emanating on either side the energy that shiva has is symbolized by these and then you have a crown you know this one's different than the one on the cave uh shiva from the cave temple but it's the same concept right the crown is tall and and very ornate intricate if you want to write it that way and that is symbolic of the importance of course the power the influence of shiva now what this doesn't have that the one in the book has and you might want to write and we'll wrap it up with a formal analysis and then i'll stick around for any questions is that the, the arms don't hold the two extended arms the, the far one on the far right and the far left do not hold the two things that the one in the Stockstead photo in the text does have, and every other image I've seen of Shiva does, which is usually, just say it this way to wrap up the meaning notes, one more fact, that Shiva is usually shown with, of her forearms, two of them are extended, and one is holding a drum symbolic of the forces of creativity and uh, the rhythm of life, a drum, which they, he or she, would, you know, create this rhythm with the drum, the rhythm of creation of life of birth and the other is one of the flames a ball of flame and here that's not the case so for whatever reason they chose this artist not to depict shiva that way but most of the times she was shown that way and that of course again as you might guess is symbolic of shiva's power over the destructive forces of the universe of death destruction chaos violence and all the negative things that exist in the universe. Okay, let's do a formal analysis and then um, you can ask any questions you may have. All right, is balanced or is it? I think it is, but there seems to be more negative space here, doesn't there? So if you want to say it's unbalanced toward the pose is balanced, right, by definition, but because three of the four arms, right, and somewhat most of both legs, right, depending on where you draw the line down the middle, are on the left side in this photo, uh, this slide, uh, you can say it's unbalanced toward the left, our left. Okay, the largest mass is Shiva, and then the ring of fire, I would say, and then maybe the, the cosmic energy emanating from uh, Shiva's head, 
and lastly the dwarf. There's the rhythm of the forearms, two legs, the hands, the feet, of course, the, the uh, flames, it's supposed to be balls of fire actually, with flames coming out of them. Uh, that creates all powerful rhythm. And there isn't a straight line in it, I, I, except the bass. And I think that's original, but other than the bass, everything is curved. So it's almost entirely dynamic. There is simulated texture on the face, right? And uh, the body, you know, on the toes and the hands, the fingers, and even on the uh, balls of, of fire or flames emanating from them and, uh, the, and on the crown, there's a lot of simulated texture. There's also the smooth texture of bronze, it's a bronze piece. Uh, and all the texture, simulated texture is created with carved line. It's a, it's a cool greenish gray color. Every one I've seen of this is depending on how it's oxidized over the years. If this is left out in the air somewhere, it's gonna look more green, but it's never a warm color. Bronze can be, of course, but it, if it was originally, it is, it is now. So it's a cool greenish uh, gray color or bluish gray, if you prefer, depending on <laughs> what your computer screen shows. And that, therefore, obviously no warm colors, only cool. Uh, and then um, let's see, space. Yeah, that's, that's the last one. For space, we have a, about a two foot high, uh, you know, sculpture with a figure that's about 18 inches high, right? And so it's real space, except there is overlapping of the crown over the head. And there's some jewelry on Shiva's uh, body. And then Shiva's, one of Shiva's feet overlaps the dwarf at the bottom. Okay, we covered everything. I think we did well, and it's, it's only a little after nine. So don't forget your papers are due. Actually, you have almost four weeks uh, to do them, but don't wait till a week before they're due. Uh, and um, I will be sending you a reminder of the extra credit options, uh, more specifically describing them because nobody has done more than about 20 points max, most people less, if any. Uh, so you might not feel the need to if you're doing well, but don't forget you can email me anytime during the semester and I will get back to you as soon as I see your email with your total points and your, your grade thus far. Uh, but if you wanna do the extra credits, you have until the week of the final, not after the final to submit extra credit. And then finally, there is, um, you know, the likelihood uh, of uh, some kind of uh, extra credit option of sorts. If I, I'll just say, if you see anything, <laughs> uh, I'll send you an email. If something comes up from that project I mentioned at the beginning, where there is an actual story about the music being played to lift people's spirits at these mass vaccination centers, you may or may not see anything about it. But if something happens, and that's worth extra credit, just as any article about anything from any online source, uh, you know, obviously, most newspapers have online, you could, for instance, find that article that was in today's Chronicle, that's today's date, March 31st, and forward that to me if you want. Uh, but I do expect you to actually read the article before you send it to me. So don't just send a link if you want five points for an article. I, I need to see that you actually looked at the article. So it needs to be a screenshot or the actual article as a PDF. Okay, um, we've covered most things, but I know there, there's people who joined us later uh, or otherwise didn't maybe get you all the details of my announcements about the you know midterm, small, minor, though they are uh, snafus. Sometimes people didn't get their grade back because of uh, inconsistencies in the email addresses that I had on file. So. Again, if you're one of those people who didn't get your grade back and you did submit the exam on time, you need to email me again with the email address that you registered for this class this semester, that email address. Because I get things from people who there's no, no knowing who they are, except for the tagline, if they usually do, which says midterm, then I know I should open it and look at it. But if the email address doesn't match the, the anything close to the name of a student or the email address that's on file at the JC, they're, they're very unlikely, those students, to get their um, test uh, back. I can always summarize your grade in just one or two lines. But if you want to see the actual test and all the marks, the graded you know, portions of the test, you'll need to make sure, if you didn't already, that you have given me a uh, correct email address that is the one you registered for the class in, in this class. OK, any other questions about anything related to grades uh, or you know, not getting back 
anything you can email me that of course or or uh anything we covered tonight anything else at all i actually have a few questions sure, sure go ahead um my first question is for the final will anything from the uh first half of the semester no no it's not cumulative. yeah i've been mentioning or no it'll be all second half. oh everything after nothing before the midterm you don't have to even think about it right i hope that's good news and we're going to cut that list down quite a bit 40 percent Remember, that's the night before the week before the final. You I'm sorry, I could hear you. Do the... the week before the final, we will reduce the study list, uh, but that'll be like. All right, so oh. nothing from the mid. Yeah, it's not cumulative. Yeah, I've been saying that all semester. Yeah, don't worry about anything before the midterm. Okay. All right. You had another question? Perfect. Is that. Uh, yeah. So for for my paper, for a second paper, I have a uh, piece of art in mind. However, I only have access to a black and white printer and scanner, unfortunately. Hey, would that, and, the, and while the uh, piece is mostly neutral, there are some uh, shades of red with it, mainly the, the piece's eyes and uh, dorsal plates. It's okay, a, I can uh, answer monster. that question. I think uh, you are responsible for finding, if need be, at a, you know, I don't know, the library used to be open for you to do this. I don't know if it is yet again. Probably not on either campus, but there are places you can go to that are open where you can get color pr prints and then, you know, take a whatever, a screenshot of that or make a PDF out of it. So you you might still be able to get even an A minus on your paper if everything else was perfect, but you would have a few points off. If you if you have a work of art where there's any color, you need to produce a color image for to get full credit. Uh, otherwise, you have at, at least five points off, I can tell you that, which might not be that drastic for you if everything else is fine they might still have an a minus or you know what i mean 90 some points but but if you don't want to risk that you'll need to take these steps whatever is required to get somewhere where you can produce a color image of it so i'm pretty that, confident i'll nail the rest of it that uh, can take a few uh, a yeah that's up to you <laughs> just do have a head I'm in yeah it's I'm a standard rule could... for everybody I, I i think that's fair yeah because that's that's how i wrote it in the, you know, instructions on five requirements for your papers. Okay, any other questions from anyone, you or anyone else that I haven't already answered? Any other questions about the test, your upcoming papers? You remember, you, you, you definitely need to pick something. You can find plenty of new sources, at least three new ones, even if you, it's in Stockstead or uh, Gill. And if you choose to do architecture, I'm going to give you a little bit of a leg up, not an advantage, but a little help not in writing or the research, but pointing you in the right direction. And I will resend to everybody in all my classes the uh, new handout I created just this semester called Tips for Writing About Architecture, because uh, architecture is, is, is slightly different on some elements, you know, such as uh, textures. Usually they're not simulated in buildings, mostly they're real, that kind of thing. Space, remember, in a building, there's no techniques for space. The building is the space, the real dimensions. So I will send that uh, that handout again to everybody well before the deadline. But you've got three, three and a half weeks, isn't it? Almost four weeks before it's due the last week of April. Um, I think so. Let me just double check if I misspeak and people will hold me to that because it isn't the same for both classes. Um, no, it's April 14th. So it is two and a half weeks. Yeah. No, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. Yeah, April 14th. Uh, I did that because if I get all the papers from all my students or most of my students in both classes, it's overwhelming all at once. So you guys, the other class started later than you did anyway. So so you guys have two weeks. So I'm glad I caught that. It's in your syllabus and the, the, the deadline needs to stay the same as is printed in the syllabus. So keep that in mind. You want to get busy. If you haven't picked a work of art, you should by now uh, or soon, very, very soon, and then begin the research. Okay. And you can query me with any questions you have. Can All right. Be, any other like, questions? Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. If we did for the first paper a work of art, do we have to choose an architect, like a structure for the next one? I was thinking of, that's an it. I'm glad you asked that. My reader, the one I've had the longest, she thought I should do that. But I'm thinking I will give you the flexibility because what the main point is for you to want to do a paper on something so that it's inspiring enough for you, interesting, you know, motivating enough for you to get well passionate if possible about that art and that artist. Uh, and therefore, you know, you want to have a work that makes you feel motivated. So 
no, you don't have to do one on architecture. I may do that next semester with the R 2.3. I will actually, because there's so much architecture covered in that if I teach 2.3 or even 1.2, but I, even this semester, you guys 1.1. So would it, I'd say consider doing a work on architecture because I can give you some helpful advice on that. But that doesn't mean it's any easier or less easy to write than one on painting or sculpture. You decide, that's your choice, okay? I'm trying to be flexible and, you know, give you the maximum uh, options, you know, flex flexibility, I guess they call it, right? So it's uh, something, just pick something, you know, you can find new information for the research aspect, new sources, easily A and B that you really care about, okay? That's the only requirement. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, I think we've finished about 20 minutes early as I predicted. So, all right, you guys have a good week. And if you can get your vaccinations, go out there and do that. And just make sure you give yourself a day or two to recover afterwards. I'll see you all a week from tonight. And if you have questions about your papers, I, I'm not going out of town at all between now and the end of the semester, I will be able to respond within a day or so. All right, good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Take care. Good night. We'll see you guys. Have a good week.